Very good. Okay, so Dave has just um, stopped and restarted the recording. Um, we're going to move on to the next speaker. Um, so it's a great pleasure to welcome Scott Aronson um, from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, Scott, I think I've just unmuted you, so we should be able to hear ah, you. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, indeed. Welcome. All right, great. Um, right. So uh, feel free to share your screen. And um, uh, ah, I, I didn't really prepare any slides. So. Oh, okay. That's, that's also fine. So, um, right. so Dave told us at the beginning of the session that you were keen to sort of talk for, um, for 10 minutes or so and make this sort of a little bit of a Q and a, um, yeah. I'll sort of leave it up to Dave, of course, as the, as the main organizer, he said that it might sort of flow naturally into the panel discussion. So mm -hmm. you maybe just, uh, sort of take the lead for, um, for the first bit and we'll see how it naturally transitions. Let me uh, um, just suggest that, uh, at least for the start, everybody else turn off their video. I was, uh, and um, then uh, during the Q&A, we can pop people back in uh, for uh, Q&A. Perfect. So welcome, Scott. And um, uh, Thank you. All right. Well, uh, uh, so uh, uh, thanks very much for, for having me here. So um, I uh, work mainly in uh, uh, quantum computing theory. So, uh, you know, I uh, uh, have, have not worked in, in analog uh, computing, really, but uh, uh, you know, I do think a lot about uh, computation and physics and, you know, what are the limits of what we can uh, uh, compute in, in the physical world. And um, so David Snoke, uh, when he uh, invited me here, uh, he, he asked me to come and to say uh, a few words about uh, the physical church touring thesis. Uh, so well, what it means and, and what its implications are uh, for analog computation. And then uh, maybe, you know, just uh, uh, moderate a little bit of a Q&A about it, uh, which, which I'm uh, very happy to do. Okay, so, so what is the uh, church touring thesis? Well, you know, the, the original version uh, from uh, uh, church and touring uh, themselves in the 1930s was sort of like a definition of, you know, this is what we mean by a function being computable. Um, uh, but uh, uh, with, with the benefit of hindsight, you know, I prefer to think of the thesis more as, as an empirical statement, as a, a statement about physics, you know, whether, whether it's one that Church or Turing themselves would have endorsed. Uh, so uh, uh, nowadays, especially, you know, uh, with the uh, growth of uh, the field of quantum computing and information over the last 40 years, uh, we tend to talk about the, the physical Church Turing thesis. Okay, which um, I'll, I'll take to be uh, the statement that any computational process in nature, you know, that is sort of any process uh, uh, where you can reliably specify an input and, and then get an output later. So, you know, so that uh, it sort of merits being called a, a computer at all, uh, uh, can be simulated uh, uh, to any desired precision uh, by a Turing machine. Okay, uh, so, you know, this is a, uh, uh, you know, a hypothesis that connects uh, physics with uh, the theory of computation, or it sort of identifies, you know, the Turing machine model as sort of, you know, the right model of computation, you know, to capture uh, uh, whatever you could do in the physical world, right? It says that Turing machines, you know, haven't, haven't missed anything. Uh, now, People also often talk about the extended or the polynomial time uh, charge touring thesis. And uh, that would say that, that moreover, you know, not, not only is there a simulation of any physical process uh, by a Turing machine, but the simulation uh, can be made to be efficient, by which we mean uh, costing only a polynomial overhead in time and memory. Okay, so it would say sort of any, uh, uh, physical process in nature can be simulated, you know, by, uh, say, a deterministic Turing machine, you know, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, uh, reading and writing symbols on a, on a, you know, discrete symbols on a paper tape or whatever, with only a polynomial overhead in, in time and memory. Or in other words, that sort of the, the right complexity class, the right class of problems to capture what we could efficiently compute uh, in nature would be P. Or if we allow the use of random number generators, then you know, possibly a slightly larger class, like a BPP, 
which means bounded error probabilistic polynomial time. You know, p just means what we can compute in polynomial time. Um, although, you know, if good enough pseudo random uh, number generators exist, then those two are actually the same thing anyway. And that's what uh, many computer scientists uh, today conjecture. Okay, now, Today, most of us actually think that that extended church Turing thesis is false. And uh, the reason why we think that it's false is because of the possibility of quantum computation. Okay, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the, the great discoveries uh, in, uh, really in, in all of science, you know, a quarter of, cent of a century ago was that uh, if you built a scalable quantum computer, and if it works, you know, the way that theory uh, says that it should work, uh, then um, it could solve certain problems in um, polynomial time, like factoring numbers, for example. You could factor an n-digit number in only about order n squared steps using Shor's factoring algorithm. Uh, whereas uh, the best known uh, classical algorithms for factoring take time that grows exponentially. Uh, uh, um, exponentially with the cube root of the, of the length of the number, uh, to be precise. Now, no one has proven that there couldn't be a fast way to factor numbers with a classical computer, but, you know, they've been trying for half a century for, you know, uh, um, um, obvious reasons, including that, you know, the security of most of our electronic commerce depends on the belief that factoring is hard. Uh, and so if, if, if indeed it is hard for a classical computer, then, then the, ex and, and if indeed quantum computers can be built, then this extended church Turing thesis is false, okay? Uh, and of course, uh, we, people have not yet succeeded in building truly scalable quantum computers. Uh, most of us believe that that will require the development of uh, error corrected qubits and fault tolerant qubits, which, um, many, many groups around the world are racing towards, but which have not yet been demonstrated. Uh, just uh, less than a year ago, uh, as many of you probably saw, we did see the first announcement ever of uh, the achievement of quantum supremacy, okay, which meant solving some contrived problem with a device with uh, 53 qubits, a superconducting device uh, built by Google, uh, that, uh, um, where we think that it would take roughly two to the 53 power steps, or about nine quadrillion steps with a classical computer uh, to uh, solve the equivalent problem. Okay, so, uh, so you know, I would say that, you know, if, if you believe that that worked and that that could scale, and moreover, that there's not going to be a fast classical algorithm discovered to do the same thing, right, which we know would have to be very, very different from any of the classical algorithms that we know, then uh, the extended church Turing thesis is false. Okay, and, th and that is a great discovery. But even then, one can formulate uh, uh, a quantum extended church Turing thesis. So, you know, one can just modify the conjecture a little bit to say, well, what we, what we should have uh, conjectured is just that any physical system can be efficiently simulated by a quantum computer. Okay, so, uh, uh, and, that thesis, I would say, remains compatible, at least with everything that we have learned uh, about the laws of physics. Uh, there has been work, you know, sh uh, even, you know, in the very early days, like when Richard Feynman and others were thinking about quantum computing, they uh, noticed that you could take systems of fermions and bosons and you could simulate them using a, uh, a programmable quantum computer built out of uh, what, we, what we now call qubits. And um, more recently, uh, there has been work by uh, Jordan Lee and Preskill and by others uh, saying that you could even take uh, quantum field theories, at least the ones that we know how to formulate precisely enough. And typically, these can also be simulated on uh, a quantum computer uh, with only a uh, polynomial slowdown. Okay, so, you know, the, the current debates are typically about whether the quantum extended church Turing thesis uh, would extend even to quantum gravity, okay? So, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you consider situations where, you know, observers are falling into black holes, where they're monitoring the Hawking radiation that comes out of a black hole, you know, can even these be simulated in polynomial time using a quantum computer? 
And there have been very interesting debates about that just over the last couple of years, uh, where you know it seems to be that you know there 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 might be things uh, beyond uh, you know that, that that we don't know how to simulate with a quantum computer that uh, you could do at least in in sort of hypothetical scenarios involving uh, quantum gravity, involving ADS CFT, and so on. But even then. Uh, you might never be able to tell anybody about the violation of the uh, quantum extended church Turing thesis that you had seen because it might only be observable if you jump into a black hole and then you can't tell any of your friends about it. And well, no, but it might be that no one person who jumps into the black hole can see it. You might need to combine the experiences of many different people who jump into entangled black holes is that they would not be able to uh, communicate, you know, uh, ways that they wouldn't be able to do in real life. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, at least for sort of terrestrial experiments, let's say, the quantum extended church Turing thesis remains, you know, on very solid ground. And, um, you know, but, but even sort of beyond that, the church, you know, nothing in quantum computing has ever posed the slightest challenge to the original church Turing thesis because the original church Turing thesis talks only about what is computable, not about how, how, how long it takes to compute it, right? And even a quantum computer we know could be simulated by a standard Turing machine if you just give it exponentially more time, like enough time to uh, write a description of the entire quantum state, of the uh, entire wave function. Okay, so you know, the church Turing thesis, you know, the quantum extended church Turing thesis, uh, these are not proven facts. Uh, by their nature, they, they cannot be proven. Uh, they are falsifiable empirical hypotheses you know, about nature. Uh, but I guess the main point that I wanted to make is that these are uh, the cornerstones of, you know, I guess the current theoretical understanding of physics and computation. So you know, if they are false, then that is a really huge deal, right? And uh, you know, it's not some side comment, you know, along the way to, you know, doing something else, right? I think that if they are false, then they have to be, you know, frontally attacked. You know, it has to be sort of shown that they are false, and you know, then that is uh, that's a that that I think that's a major revision to our understanding of nature. Uh, now, you know, why do why did people come to believe uh, in the physical church Turing thesis? Well, you know, one way of seeing it is that, you know, there's been by now a long history of uh, proposals that would challenge this thesis. And, you know, I think that every one of them, uh, when analyzed in enough detail, you know, has been found to fail uh, for, for, for various reasons. Um, so let's, let's uh, see a couple of examples. I mean, you know, there have been a lot, you know, there's a whole literature about what's called hyper computation, uh, about, you know, sort of hypothetical proposals for building physical devices that could solve the halting problem in a finite amount of time, for example. And uh, a, a lot of these proposals um, boil down to uh, what I like to call the Zeno computer, right, which would just mean, okay, if we could speed up, you know, uh, computation time arbitrarily so that like we could build a machine that did the first step of a Turing computation in one second, uh, the second step in half a second, the third step in a quarter of a second, uh, the fourth step in an eighth of a second, and then a sixteenth of a second, and so on. Then clearly, you know, within two seconds, we would have done infinitely many steps, and it, you know, we we would be able to solve the whole thing problem, you know as well as, you know, NP-complete problems and, and, and uh, uh, all sorts of other things. Uh, this would be uh, quite, a, quite amazing, you know, quite useful, obviously. And, you know, if you look at certain formalizations of classical physics, um, you know, you, uh, uh, you, you know and, and especially like situations that you can construct in a general relativity, for example, you can make it look like you, you would have this ability. There were papers by Malament and Hogarth, for example, that set out this case. Okay, but um, uh, you know what? 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 I uh, the 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 difficulty that I've had is that all of these analyses have sort of um, ignored quantum mechanics 
And they've also ignored the amount of energy that it takes to speed up computation by that much, right? I mean, there is a reason why our computers have fans on, you know, in them because, you know, uh, uh, and, and there's a reason why we don't typically overclock our microprocessors by too much, run them too much faster than the recommended speed. If we do that, there's a danger that they will overheat and they will melt. Okay, so, uh, you know, as you wanted to run a processor faster and faster, uh, you would need uh, more and more energy to do that. We, this is what, what physics tells us. Uh, first, you know, energy needed for cooling. Uh, you know, when it becomes fast enough, you might as well just talk about the energy that's inherent in the computation itself. Okay, and you can ask, what is the ultimate limit of this? And as far as current physics can say, uh, the ultimate limit would occur at or before uh, you reach the Planck scale. Okay, uh, the Planck scale would mean uh, that you're doing one step of computation every 10 to the minus 43 seconds, uh, roughly, or you know about one step per Planck time. Okay, if we imagine that your computer was a, uh, you know, involved photons, for example, then a a photon that that uh, ticks off one clock step per Planck time would be, let's say, bouncing back and forth between two mirrors that were one Planck length apart about 10 to the minus 33 centimeters apart. Okay, now uh, the thing that happens when you get to that scale is that you can calculate that, you know, the, the energy of a photon as you confine it to a smaller and smaller space, have it tick off faster and faster steps becomes larger and larger. And um, event, you know, and at, at the Planck scale is simply the, the point where the energy, where, 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 where that photon would exceed its own Schwarzschild radius. Okay, and that is simply just sort of a fancy way of saying that at that point your computer collapses to a black hole. Okay, which, uh, you know, is a sort of a, a uh, uh, you know, an amusing way for nature to enforce that, you know, you can't do something, right? But, you know, that, that this may sound sort of ridiculously theoretical, ridiculously far away from, uh, 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 you know, anything that we would ever have to care about in practice. Right, but when people talk about these hypercomputing proposals that involve these sort of repeated halvings of computation time, then you know it only takes you know on the order of you know between 100 and 200 of those before you're at the Planck scale, right? So you know, um, you know, it, 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 it actually is a limit. Of course, in practice, we would expect the limits to come much sooner. Um, people have also talked about relativity computers which, you know, were like, for example, if you left your computer on Earth and then you accelerated to uh, near the speed of light and then decelerated and returned to Earth, then you could find that in Earth's reference frame, you know, billions of years had passed, you know, maybe civilization has collapsed, all your friends uh, are gone, but if you can find your computer, then you can read out the answer to your hard problem, right? This is another fun proposal, but once again, you have to think about the amount of energy that it would take uh, to actually accelerate to relativistic speed. And what you find is that if you wanted an exponential computational speed up, well, then you would need an exponential amount of energy. So, you know, once again, you're simply, you know, shifting the, the burden from one place to another. Now, you know, you could say that the more fundamental thing that is sort of behind uh, uh, all, all of this is, um, you know, something that, you know, theoretical physicists uh, uh, now believe, which is called uh, the Bekenstein bound, okay, which is a, uh, a bound that comes from, um, well, came originally from thought experiments involving black holes. Uh, um, you know, it can now, you know, um, um, one, one, one can actually argue for, for large parts of it using only quantum field theory, but uh, the, the sort of the holographic version of Bekenstein's bound basically says that if you take any um, bounded physical system, then we could fully describe its quantum state using a finite number of qubits. And specifically, the number of qubits that are needed to describe any physical system uh, should be uh, bounded by the surface area, you know, of a, of a boundary enclosing that system. And it goes at a rate of about 10 to the 69 qubits per square meter, okay? Now that, uh, 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 some of you might know, is exactly the um, 
talking Bekenstein entropy of a black hole. Okay, so the Bekenstein bound would basically say that a black hole is the most entropic object that the laws of physics allow. It is the densest hard drive that the laws of physics, you know, allow, right? It is great for storage density. A, a black hole is not so good for, for retrieving the bits, okay? But, uh, uh, um, but, but basically this comes from, you know, uh, uh, thought experiments where you, you, real, you sort of reason that if you could, if you had a way to store bits or qubits more densely than that, then that would actually cause your system to collapse to a black hole. And from then on, the storage density would just be given by uh, the area of the uh, event horizon in, in Planck units, or, or rather by, by, by uh, about a, a one quarter of that. Okay, so if true, then the Bekenstein bound sort of demonstrates constructively, you know, why no one would have succeeded in building an analog computer that can do these hypercomputing tasks, such as solving the halting problem. Uh, uh, why, why it shouldn't surprise us that no one has succeeded in that, you know, namely that it's because, you know, any bounded physical system actually could be simulated by a quantum computer with a finite collection of qubits. Um, okay, so there's just, you know, a couple things, you know, maybe last things that I, I wanted to uh, address because I, I uh, you know, sort of know that they would come up. Uh, first question is, well, why aren't quantum computers themselves analog computers, right? So, you know, a quantum computer is a device, uh, you know, whose state would be, a, you know, a quantum state, which means a collection of amplitudes, okay? And, you know, if I have like 100 qubits, let's say, I would have two to the 100 power amplitudes, uh, one for every possible configuration of the qubit. So there's exponentially many of these. And the amplitudes are complex numbers. Right, and there is nothing in the laws of physics to say that amplitudes have to belong to any discrete set. You know, they form a continuum. And so some people say that that, that sounds a lot uh, like, like a form of analog computing. In fact, you know, some skeptics of quantum computing say, well, you know, it will never work because, you know, it will face the same obstacles that classical analog computing faces. Okay, but, you know, there's a, a really crucial difference between the two. Uh, one way to see the difference is that in quantum mechanics, we never directly observe an amplitude, okay? So amplitudes only show up when we're trying to calculate the probability that we see one outcome versus another one. And, you know, with a quantum computer, the actual outcomes that we see when we make a measurement are discrete. Like each particle is either spin up or spin down. Each qubit is either a zero or a one and so forth. The amplitudes uh, only show up, you know, as tools to calculate the probabilities of these different outcomes. Okay, so, um, and, and, and closely related to that, the Schrodinger equation, uh, which, you know, tells us how the quantum state evolves uh, before we measure it, tells us that it evolves by means of unitary transformation. Uh, the Schrodinger equation is a perfectly linear equation, right, which means that at least at the level of amplitudes, there is no chaotic behavior. There is no taking a tiny error in an amplitude and then just sort of blowing it up in time, right? A small error in amplitudes will remain a small error. Okay, this is just because, you know, unitary transformations preserve inner products between vectors and, and, and they are linear, okay? So, um, so these are kind of crucial differences where, you know, I would think of quantum computing as sort of, you know, maybe, you know, it, it is not digital computing, but it's not analog either. Or if you had to pick one, you would say that it is digital, but it is quantum digital. Okay, and this is very related to the fact that we can actually error correct qubits, which was a huge um, theoretical discovery in quantum computing in the mid 90s, and which was what sort of created the, you know, uh, uh, current belief of most of us that scalable quantum computers uh, can be built at all. Okay, now the last thing that I wanted to address is, you know, if what, uh, you know, if the charge Turing thesis and so on are correct, you know, then does that mean that analog computing is necessarily useless or, or, or hopeless? Well, no, no, it doesn't mean that. Uh, you know, in fact, we've already seen in the history of computer science, 
you know, back in the 50s and 60s, you know, analog computers did find uh, all kinds of uses. And, you know, and earlier than that, I guess, you know, Beneaver Bush's differential analyzer, you know, and in the um, development of quantum computing, you know, it looks very plausible that history will repeat itself. And that, you know, before we get progr fully programmable digital quantum computers, we may well have more and more analog quantum simulators that are useful for, you know, various uh, special purposes like simulating quantum systems, okay? What the uh, church touring thesis would mean is that you are not going to get from analog computing the kind of thing that you get from quantum computing, which is an asymptotic scaling advantage, you know, over what you can do with a Turing machine, you know. So, so in other words, you know, you, you may get advantages, uh, you know, that, that uh, are sort of contingent, you know, on technology that, you know, may last a certain amount of time and then, you know, digital computing may come along and do better as happened in the history of classical computing when, you know, digital just became better for so many things and it left less and less of a niche for analog computing, although it still does have some, some niches. Uh, so, um, so if the uh, uh, church touring thesis and especially the quantum extended church touring thesis are true, then I would say that analog computing cannot get, you know, an uh, asymptotic scaling advantage over a conventional touring machine. You know, if they're wrong, well, then, you know, that is, that is a revolution in our understanding of nature. And uh, I hope that we discover that and I hope we discover the reasons why. So, uh, so that's about all I had to say and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, so well, thank you very much, Scott, for the really nice perspective on, on all of these things. Um, I, I enjoyed that very much. I'm sure Hi. very many people did. Thanks. Um, so, so yeah, so thanks for that. Um, what we'll do is uh, first take one or two questions and then I think Dave was keen to morph over into the panel session. Um, mm -hmm. So Vincenzo Savona um, has a couple of questions to kick us off. Yeah. Um, so I'll just make sure I unmute him. Mm -hmm. Vincenzo. Thank you, Andrew. It's, I'm unmuted now. So thank you very much, Scott. It's always uh, a great intellectual pleasure to read you and to listen to you. Um, uh, I, I actually had two questions, but I think that you sort of answered the second one, which is about analog computers. Uh, I will ask the first one. It's about uh, uh, quantum computers. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a quantum physicist, so I'm going to play devil's advocate and say, is it still possible that, uh, that, that the quantum computing uh, is uh, by some very, very fundamental uh, uh, principle of physics, uh, uh, not possible. And that what I'm thinking is, for example, that uh, quantum error correction uh, is based uh, on these uh, threshold theorems, okay? They mm -hmm. tell you that it's uh, like the Kita F mode at some point, uh, by increasing the number of physical quantum bits, you, you improve on the, on the error rate of the logical qubit. Could the, these models uh, uh, for threshold theorems, they assume some very specific uh, error model, okay? Could it be that there are, uh, there is a, with vanishing, with, with vanishing rate, uh, very strongly correlated errors? Mm -hmm. well, for, for increasing range uh, in space, so in the number of qubits, but with vanishing probabilities, but such that when you resum all these effects, the threshold theorem is no longer uh, is no longer effective, uh, and essentially this makes quantum error correction uh, ineffective, and by that also fault tolerant quantum computing. I mean, I'm thinking of something that relates in some way to thermodynamics or to whatever whatever mm -hmm. fundamental principle we have in physics. Could it, has somebody yeah. considered this? Yeah, I mean, I mean, of course this is possible. <laughs> I mean, until you actually have the error corrected quantum computer with millions of qubits it will always be open to someone to say, well, maybe it's impossible. Just like, you know, until the Wright brothers flight, you know, you could always say, well, maybe heavier than air flight was impossible and so on. You know, I would say that, you know, at this point, I think that the burden of proof is firmly on the side of those who think that it's not possible, right? You know, I, I think that, you know, the belief that it can be done is just a conservative position. Right, it's the boring <laughs> position, right? Yeah, I know. That's the <laughs> position that just takes, you know, what we what we already know for granted. Now, now uh, you're right that that sort of, you know, uh, uh, if if quantum computing were to be impossible, 
you know, one of the main ways to kill it would be, you know, if you could somehow violate the assumptions that are made in these fault tolerance theorems that you mentioned, right? You know, Gil Kalai, uh, who, you know, I know very well has been a quantum computing skeptic for, you know, 15 years, right? And he's been, you know, putting out paper after paper, you know, trying to do that, you know, you know, always sort of changing his argument, but, you know, always with the same yeah. concluding line that, you know, quantum computing should be impossible, right? He had predicted that, you know, Google's quantum supremacy experiment could never be done. Okay. Yeah, I know, uh, I know. After, I know after, <laughs> after, after it was done, then he had, you know, he put out papers saying basically he can't, you know, he spent months on it. He can't find the flaw in the experiment, but it is too incredible for him to believe. So therefore he's going to proceed on the assumption that something was false about it. So let, let, let me precise that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm on the boring side, so I, I'm yeah, not yeah, a skeptic, yeah. okay, that, I'm, that, I'm an that's enthusiast fine. myself. That's fine, but okay. I'm telling you, but, uh, say, you know, these, are, these, are, these are positions that you can take. They're positions you know, that, that, that some smart people do take. They're positions that, have fault, that make falsifiable empirical predictions, right? Sure. And... Um, uh, you know, now, now uh, uh, you know, Gill continues and, and, and other various other quantum computing skeptics, you know, continue to say, well, you know, even if you have done, you know, quantum supremacy, you know, the, you know that's just not going to scale, right? That, you know, you're, you're somehow you were never going to be able to build an error corrected sure. qubit. You know, something, you know, in, in the theory is, is wrong about that and you will never be able to scale up, right? So, I mean, I think that, you know, the burden for people who believe that is, you know, again, to find something that is wrong, you know, or find some wrong assumption in yeah. these fault tolerance theorems, right? And the independence of the errors, you know, would be an obvious candidate, right? You do assume something about that, you know, the errors that are hitting your computer are not conspiratorially correlated, right? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> that they have some kind of independence to them. Now, you know, if they were correlated enough, that is the kind of thing that really could kill quantum computation, okay? But I think an important point for people to understand about that is that that is the kind of thing that if it were there would also kill classical computation, okay? So, you know, these skeptics of quantum computing, they're always walking this fine line. They have to be very, very careful okay. that whatever model they invent that would kill, you know, whatever model of noise they invent that would kill quantum computing is not so strong that it would also kill uh, scalable classical computing. Okay. okay. And, you know, and, 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 and the, the issue is that, you know, these sort of the difficulties in scaling them up, like there are some new challenges with quantum computing. You have the challenge of decoherence. Right, which you know has no real analog in classical computing. Right, a classical computer is perfectly happy to let everyone see all of its bits, you know, at every step, you know, as it's computing. You can uh, uh, watch the, uh, uh, you know, wa uh, watch the sausage being made. Right, a quantum computer, you know, you have to very, very carefully not look at it until you're ready to look. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the basic idea that you, you use redundancy, you know, you encode one logical bit or qubit across many, many physical bits or, or qubits. You um, constantly monitor to see if errors have occurred and you correct them. Uh, you, uh, you know, you do this in multiple hierarchical layers. These are actually very, very similar in, you know, like the classical fault tolerance that von Neumann discovered in the 1950s and in the quantum fault tolerance that people discovered how to do in the 1990s. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it's, a, you know, now, now classical fault tolerance, we ended up not needing uh, uh, to, to do it actively so much, but that was just because transistors became so reliable that, you know, they just, they sort of have the fault tolerance built in. And they, you know, they essentially only fail when a cosmic ray hits them or something sure. like that, right? So, uh, you know, and, and it's true that we have not, no one has yet invented the quantum computing analog of the transistor, right? Some people hope that topological qubits, you know, or non-abelian anions will someday be that, okay? But, uh, you know, we don't have that yet. So right now we are thinking about active error correction, just like von Neumann was for classical computing back in the 50s. Okay, but uh, you know, it, it, um, you know, it's very, very hard. Uh, 
you know, uh, is to come up with, you know, a principled reason why it couldn't work that wouldn't also prove that, that scalable classical computing wouldn't work. Okay, that's, that's the point that I want to make. And if someone uh, could discover such a principled reason, then I think that that itself would be a revolution in our understanding of quantum mechanics. You know, I'm sure that that would be worth, you know, at least a couple of Nobel prizes. And, uh, <laughs> but, you know, but again, that's, that's that, you know, that would be the more surprising outcome. That's not the one okay. that I expect. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, I will save the, the question about analog computer for the, for the discussion later on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we have a quick question from the Victor Galitsky next. Um, and okay. then after that, I promised to Dave that I'd hand over to him for a quick question comment and onto the panel session. So mm -hmm. I'll unmute Victor mm -hmm. and we'll hand over to Dave after that. Uh, yeah, thanks uh, very much, Scott and uh, Andrew. So I just um, have a question from um, the perspective of, a, I'm a many body quantum theorist. So, and um, so basically in, my field, so to speak. So we have kind of two kinds of systems. So most systems thermalize. If you have a large system with many quantum degrees of freedom, usually what you see is chaos and thermalization, not pure unitary dynamics. Mm -hmm. And then there is a very small uh, set of systems, which are called integrable systems, which do not thermalize. And they're kind mm -hmm. of nothing else. Now, when I look at the, let's say, scalable quantum computer, which has, I don't know, millions or billions or however many qubits, What's actually the difference between that and a many-body quantum system? And if so, then uh, if it is actually similar, so uh, presumably you don't want it to thermalize, you don't want it to de develop chaos. So what does mm -hmm. it mean in the context of this, um, you know, this quantum error correction? Is it basically something which makes the system integrable? So what? The, how do? How, mm -hmm. Is there any way to put it in the context of my language? Uh, uh, well, you know, I would I would say that yeah uh, yeah you 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 do not want your quantum computer to fully thermalize. I mean, it is a system where you know the dynamical behavior is completely you know is 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 the whole point, right? But it's also not a system that you know you could solve easily solve with a classical computer because if you could do that, then there wouldn't be a point in building it, right? So you know it is a system where you know each qubit has some relaxation time. Right, so you could say that each qubit is constantly trying to thermalize, right? But you know, you are actively fighting against the thermalization. Okay, you are doing that by sort of ejecting, you know, qubits after errors have occurred and pumping in fresh qubits. Okay, so in that sense, it is an open system. Okay, but uh, you know, you are um, using this active error correction process to maintain a quantum state that, you know, evolves unitarily, right? And so, you know, what is going on in these sort of protected subspace, you know, in these sort of error corrected subspace is really just, you know, that you have a two to the N dimensional Hilbert space. You have a Hilbert space of N qubits and you are acting on it by a sequence of unitary transformations, okay? That act on one or two of the qubits at a time. You know, so, so, um, um, you know, I, I don't, um, um, so, you know, I, I, I've tried, I've, from my physics friends, I've tried to get a definition of the word integrable that makes sense in my language or that I, I understand. I have largely failed in doing that, okay? I'm not sure that you would call such a system integrable, um, but, you know, it is, uh, you know, so, so uh, you know, you, you know we, we, we know that there are quantum computations that would have the effect of, you know, uh, extracting the prime factors of a 2000 digit number, take an example, right? And, you know, this is, uh, you know, you know we, we, we wouldn't expect with our classical computer to be able to easily simulate what that system is doing, right? With a classical computer and with enough time, you could write down, you know, an explicit description of what was happening, but, you know, they would involve a Hilbert space of, you know, two to the many thousands of dimensions. Okay, so I guess I'm going to jump in uh, yeah. to Andrew. So I have a, I'm going to make a comment, -y, mostly comment question, <laughs> uh, and then we'll uh, go to the panel. And you're welcome to stick mm -hmm. around for the panel as long as you, you can. So, okay. so one of the um, interesting things in all this is sort of which side do both condensates lie on? Uh, <laughs> because uh, both condensates, when you've actually got one, and uh, Natalia mentioned this this morning in her talk, it's basically a classical object uh, where you can write down a simple wave equation, a Gross-PDFC equation for it. 
Uh, but there's interesting dynamics in how you get it in the first place. And there's a lot of thinking, and we've got some condensate people here uh, at this uh, meeting, um, in terms of you go from a system which is initially uh, not a condensate, and then it cools down, uh, and you form a long-range phase coherence in the system. And so it's actually not entirely clear that a condensate in the act of thermalizing is not doing something similar to a quantum computer in being mm -hmm. fundamentally quantum. And you can sort of view it as sort of there's a, an attractor point in space, which is the equilibrium point, which it's finding exponentially fast because all the quantum particles are talking to all the other quantum particles, uh, uh, you know, simultaneously uh, as they interact with each other in this many body physics problem. It's very similar to what uh, Victor was talking about. So you have a many body physics problem that essentially is solving itself to find this one quantum state. Once it reaches that state, you now have a classical object, um, but the time to get to the classical object is uh, possibly something which has got quantum speed up in it. That has not been proven mm -hmm. uh, by mm -hmm. any means, but it's mm -hmm. not, to my knowledge, been disproven either. Um, so uh, Natalia is supposed to be on the panel. She may have a comment on that, uh, but let me let you react to that first, and then I'll introduce the panel. All right. Well, I mean, this is interesting. I, I don't feel like I know enough about those uh, condensates states to, to really say, but let me ask you something, which is, you know, can, uh, 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 can this process be efficiently simulated by a classical computer? So can I use a classical computer to calculate, you know, the, the final state that I will get at the end of this process? Well, okay. So what's interesting is you can do the following. You can say, if I have a completely homogenous system, which is a simple system, then you can use a classical computer to find that you get something with long range phase correlation in finite time. Uh, and of course, you've made that a topologically trivial system by making it on purpose homogenous. And so you definitely can simulate yeah. that with a standard yeah. computer. And that what is what has been done. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, you know, the proposal of people like Verloff and others is to now you impose this very complicated topology on the condensate. Mm -hmm. And does it now thermalize at the same amount of time that it did before when it was in a homogenous system? That's mm -hmm. not, the answer to that is not known. Yeah. Uh, well, that, if it that, did, that, it would, yeah. I mean, that sounds really interesting. I would love to know more about it. Uh, you know, I mean, it sounds like, you know, if that worked, you know, if, if so, you know, so a few things would have to be true. One, that you can actually do this experiment and, you know, and demonstrate it and read out the result. And two, that, you know, it would have to thermalize quickly enough. That, you know, you can see the result, and three that there would have to not be an efficient way to get the same thing with a classical computer, right? If we had all of that, then this could be an alternative way to demonstrate quantum supremacy, right? In some ways, that uh, might be what you call an analog quantum computer. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. And you know, look, I mean, I mean, the stuff that you know, for example, Misha Lukin's group has done, you know, with with cold atoms. I mean, this could be counted as quantum supremacy by some people's definition. You know, the, the main issue was just that you do not have nearly the degree of programmability that you would have with the Google chip, for example. Okay. But, you know, it sounds like, like if you had like a programmable Bose condensate where you could sort of dynamically change the initial conditions or the topology, or, you know, in some way, you know, in order to produce lots and lots of possible outputs. And you know you had no fast classical algorithm for mapping the initial conditions to the final state that you would see, but you know you know you could build the system you know that, that, that did it. Then you know you could call that, and you know if you could sort of give an independent definition of what problem you were solving, so that people could try to match the same performance with a classical computer, and maybe they could do it, but they could just not you know so in order to verify the result, but they just could not do it nearly as quickly. You know, if you had all of that, then I would say that, that, you know, at that point, this is an alternative way to do quantum supremacy. Okay, now, a second thing that one could wonder about is, could this be even more powerful than a quantum computer, right? And, you know, I'm, I'm skeptical about that part, simply because, you know, I certainly at this, you know, you know, sort of energy scale, where we're far away from any black hole and things like that, you know, I... I will believe in the quantum extended church Turing thesis. That is, you know, I will believe that whatever are the dynamics of the Bose condensate, we could map them onto a system of qubits and we could thereby simulate them with a quantum computer. 
Now, the subtlety is sometimes people say, ah, but my system, you know, reaches a ground state very quickly. And, you know, reaching a ground, you know, even for classical systems, reaching a ground state can be an NP-hard problem. And we don't expect even quantum computers to be able to solve NP-hard problems efficiently, right? So, so people do, you know, get into that, that argument, but my, my answer to that would simply be, well, we, it's true that we don't expect quantum computers to be able to solve NP-hard problems, but we also don't expect systems in nature more. to always quickly thermalize, to always quickly reach their ground states. And I would expect that if... I think, uh, Vincenzo, you're, uh, you're on. I'm muted. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. Muted and I'm fighting. Okay, sorry. So, which means that now I can uh, I can say <laughs> I can say uh, what I wanted to say before. Uh, I, I, it's very it's a very interesting point this uh, that you make, uh, uh, Scott, about uh, the question uh, about whether it's possible to um, to simulate the end state of uh, of an analog uh, of a, of a proposed analog. Uh, computational scheme without uh, necessarily computing the, the dynamics that leads to it. And, okay, let me, uh, uh, let me pause this for a second here. So let me introduce our panel. Uh, no, and then I'll, if, if Vincenzo, your video is off. You want to turn your video on? Yes, of course, of course. Uh, and sorry. then, um, and let me see, uh, uh, Paulus Lagoudakis was supposed to be possibly able to join us. Is he here? Um, if he is, he should turn on his uh, video. Um, but I do not see him here. So at the moment, uh, this is it. Um, so okay. we're going to do this the following way. We're going to let each panelist have a couple minutes to just make an opening statement. Uh, and then um, I will sort of monitor the muting and unmuting. We'll do it the same way where people uh, can text me and tell me they have a, uh, a question and I'll unmute them or I'll read their question for them. Um, so Vincenzo, um, uh, you've already been introduced. So, you, so go ahead, give your sure. thing and then we'll move on. Uh, we'll get, give everybody a chance before we go into something really extended. Okay, so uh, yeah, in general, uh, uh, this, uh, the ideas that, I mean, w once again, I'm not involved myself in analog, uh, in proposals for analog computation, but uh, uh, the ideas that I have in mind and that I would like to, to express here is, are the fact that, uh, uh, indeed, uh, we already had examples uh, of uh, proposals of uh, analog computation. For example, uh, for me, simulated annealing uh, is a proposal for a physical computer, okay? Uh, and uh, well, we know that it has limitations because it doesn't find the global minima, it finds, or at least it doesn't find them in a finite time. And what the key point there is the scaling of the rate of the slowness of the rate that uh, you need to find the actual global minimum, uh, the, the way it scales with the size of the system. And it's in that scaling that you see that essentially the, the extended church touring uh, works uh, because uh, it, uh, it scales uh, as uh, good or as bad as, uh, as, um, as a, a conventional digital computer. Uh, yet, one may argue that, uh, that perhaps some of these uh, machines may still be useful. Uh, uh, and the, Scott, you made this point before for some specific, for some contingent. Uh, and uh, what I like to think is that uh, uh, these machines don't improve the exponent, but they improve the prefactor in some way. But my idea is that, uh, um, I mean, are there any, any examples of this? Uh, uh, for the moment, uh, uh, I mean, I, I, conf I confess my ignorance, I don't know of any. And uh, I, and then you made this point just uh, one moment ago about uh, the simulation of the steady state. Uh, and, uh, and this is quite interesting because this goes beyond the argument of the time. So essentially you say, I don't care about the, the process uh, in time that leads to the, to, the to the solution, to the final state of the computation. As long as I can uh, compute this final state directly in a way which is efficient, so in a, in a way which is uh, power law with respect to a, to a Turing machine, then this, uh, this would be already proof uh, uh, that, th that this uh, analog computer can't do better than uh, conventional digital computing. 
and my question is uh, something that it's not clear to me. Is there a, is there a, a, a straightforward way? So is, is, is there a, a test to prove uh, uh, beyond uh, uh, reasonable doubt that, uh, that uh, a bubble soap computer doesn't perform, uh, so to say? I, I, I always mention because I have so much fun in reading uh, the, your thing about the bubble mm -hmm. soap that uh, is there a, is there something that we can a test that we can always uh, perform something which is straightforward and we say okay if if it's it's a, a criteria a fundamental criterion whatever machine I propose it must fulfill this criterion this is the question that uh, uh, that I'm asking because uh, 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 for example I would say that uh, the, the 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 polariton uh, uh, system that uh, uh, Natalia is proposing. I mean, uh, the argument that during the transient there is a moment where quantum mechanics uh, uh, starts uh, enforcing tunneling or long range uh, interactions such that there is a speed up. Uh, this this is a very good point, but I think that the classical uh, equations that uh, you have can be solved directly for the steady state without the need to solve the, to solve the dynamics. So that, and this is an algebraic equation. And this algebraic equation, uh, well, I, I, I don't know how, how hard it is to solve a nonlinear algebraic equation uh, on, a, on a digital computer, but maybe, maybe this can be done in polynomial time. So, so let me uh, let Scott respond for a couple minutes and then we'll go to Natalia. She's been sitting there very patiently. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, Natalia. Yeah, no, I would like to uh, give Natalia a chance to speak. But uh, so, all right. So, so but to, just to, to uh, address the things that I, I was just asked, in, insofar as I remember them. I mean, um, so so the issue with the prefactors. Um, I mean, I would say that there is uh, certainly a lot of historical examples where you know analog computing won on the prefactors. I mean, how long ago was it that that wind tunnels, you know, became, you know. Sort of fully outperformed by digital simulation, right? I mean, sure. I think they they you know they they retained the use for for you know a very long very long into the digital computer era, right? And so so I think that you know one 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 certainly can find such such examples, um, you know. But uh, uh, you know, of course, you know they are contingent on technology, right? It is it is not like building a quantum computer where you have some kind of theoretical guarantee that, you know, that if it works, that you, you get a win. Um, uh, so now, now regarding steady state versus dynamics, uh, I would say that it, it, it all depends on what is the problem that you're trying to solve, right? You know, in um, theoretical computer science, we start with, you know, a definition of a problem, you know, like, like what is the input, what is the output? And then we, uh, uh, Think you know separately about well then now what is the fastest way to solve that problem, right? But you know the problem has a definition independent of uh, of, of the means of solving the problem, right? So if the problem is tell me the steady tell me the uh, final state, well then once you've told me that that's the problem, then anything that I do to get that that final state is fine. It's completely fine if it if it does something other than you know, do the, the, the same time evolution that the physical system itself does, right? If you tell me that the problem is, you know, recapitulate the whole intermediate steps in the evolution, well, now, now I have to do that as well, right? And now, right, so, uh, and, and then it's a different problem. Okay, you know, regarding the uh, soap bubble computer, um, no, you know, there, there is certainly no proof that it can always be simulated by a, uh, classical computer or whatever by standard digital computer. I can say that, you know, this was my one foray into experimental physics. You know, I did actually try it out. I built the, you know, some soap bubble machines and tested them out. And, you know, what I found is that with uh, three or four or five pegs, you know, typically, uh, nature, you know, the soap, soap bubbles would solve this NP-hard problem of, you know, finding a roughly minimal configuration of bubbles to connect all of these pegs. But you start adding more, like six pegs, seven pegs, and then sometimes you know you could get uh, configurations of bubbles that have that even have cycles in them, which then proves that it that they could not be a minimum Steiner tree to connect these pegs. That you know nature is not solving this NP-hard problem. 
Now it's true that I didn't try every possible brand of soap, you know, and I could, you know, there, there, there are like infinitely many things that you could do, right? And, you know, to uh, uh, say, well, well, maybe it could still work. But, you know, I think that, that um, um, I, I at least convinced myself of the hypothesis that, you know, soap bubbles, just like any other physical system that we know about, can get trapped in local minima, right? And, you know, they follow some dynamical process you know, where they try to minimize energy, but, you know, it's a local optimization process. And presumably that process could be simulated by a classical computer. But you're right that there's no proof of that. There's only, you know, the sort of empirical case. And then you could say maybe there's the prior theoretical expectation. Okay, let's let yeah. uh, Natalia jump in there now. Yeah. Yes, yes. Hi, guys. So uh, I hope I won't forget all the comments <laughs> that were burning. Um, uh, so my first question, actually, um, Scott, is um, about uh, continuing this, this idea that David expressed about Bose-Einstein and condensation, how to simulate it. Actually, um, Emmanuel Bloch, a few years ago, uh, done this experiment, even hard experiment, showing, you know, experiment that, sh that uh, makes the transition from Bose-Einstein condensation to Mott insulator in um, the, the lattice of, um, um, in the ultra, ultra, cold, ultra cold gases. So this seemed to be already the demonstration of quantum supremacy at some level, because this is extremely deep. I mean, you cannot do it on classical computer and it's programmed because you can, um, you can uh, mimic the, the couplings between, between the sides. You can program the couplings between the sides. So do you know why it's never been considered as the demonstration of the quantum supremacy? Could you send me a link to that? Yes, yeah, I will. Okay, th th thank you, thank you. Please do, or, or you know, maybe like put it in the chat know. window or something. I would like to see a paper about that. Uh, 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 yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, there, there, there have been other, you know, demonstrations that happened. I mean, typically, um, you know, it was, um, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, and there, there were, there were, there were a couple of issues, right? One was that most of the uh, prior things that I saw. You know, including from Misha Lukin's group, for example, uh, you know, they, um, you know, did not have the nearly the degree of programmability that you, you know, saw with the Google device, right? I, you know, I mentioned this before, but it's, you know, so, uh, uh, you know, it's like you're, you're doing one specific calculation and then, you know, all it would take would be for someone to find a way to do that same calculation classically, right? Whereas, uh, you know, what we really want for quantum supremacy is a mapping from input to output where, you know, there were many different possible inputs and where, you know, you'd have to give like a, a general way to compute a whole function. Okay, but I think a further issue is just that, you know, before the Google thing came along, you know, you know and, and maybe even after it, but, you know, a lot of people just rejected the entire concept of quantum supremacy, right? They said, you know, we don't care about this or, you know, this is, you know, either because it's too obvious or, or because, you know, it's not useful. Uh, you know, all that matters is solving a useful problem. You know, whereas, um, you know, I had thought that it was really important and I sort of strongly encouraged everyone to, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, if you think that you can demonstrate quantum supremacy, well, then go for it, right? Uh, this is worth doing, right? You know, and you know, but, but that means making the case. That means sort of clearly explaining what is the computational problem being solved in such a way that someone can then try, at least try to solve that problem with their classical computer, right? They might, you know, they might not have enough time, but at least it's clear what they would have to tell their classical computer to do. Okay, and, so let's, let's, yeah. let's do no, the following. Uh, Benjamin would like to make a comment and then we'll go back to the okay, sure, sure, sure. Your second thing. Sure, please. Hi, Natalia. Hi, everybody. Uh, I, I don't want to interrupt the flow of what you were saying, Natalia, but I do want to just address this uh, notion of uh, what Emmanuel Bloch and others with BECs do as quantum supremacy. I, I believe the reason it's not considered as quantum supremacy is because the expectations of all the observables that were available to the experimenter were easily calculable using a mean theory, field theory. So, uh, but uh, not the transition. But not the transition. Yeah, I think so. to Mott insulator. I mean, this is in, this is not possible to calculate. 
it's it's calculable to any resolution that you care about in the experiment. I mean, I, I should say that even if the expectation values of observables can be efficiently calculated classically, one can still have quantum supremacy if the distribution over possible measurement results cannot be efficiently sampled by a classical computer. That's not what and they- And in fact, that was precisely about. what? I don't think that's what they were talking about. Oh, all right, all right. But, in, but, that, but that, that was actually precisely the situation with the Google experiment, yes. right? That the expectation values are all very well concentrated about a mean. You know, we don't, we don't think that there's any quantum supremacy there. Where we think the quantum supremacy is, is in the distribution over, you know, the uh, possible outcomes of measuring the 53 qubits. Okay, so um, I'm going to sort of uh, referee here. So um, Natalia will go next, and then we have a question from the audience. Um, so uh, Natalia. So. Yes, so, but now I want to go back to the main <laughs> kind of topic of, the, of this meeting, analog simulations. I would like to clarify that, of course, we live and breathe with NP-hardness assumption. <laughs> so uh, by we have much uh, more modest goal in front of us, right? It's not, you know, somehow uh, solving NP-hard problems in polynomial time. God forbid. No, no. So, but more given uh, the limitation, the time constraint or constraint on the number of spins, say, for the number of the given number of spins, we would like to find the ground state faster than if we would do it on the classical computer. And there are the examples and perhaps the hope that that can be achieved. And in, but in my talk, I specifically address the question, what is the principle that would, uh, would allow us to find the global minimum rather than local minimum? And there are examples when indeed we can do better than just getting stuck in a local minimum, but more often than not, there is another principle at play, another simplicity uh, criterion. For instance, for all these optical systems, it's really the fact that it, find, it tends to find the minimizer that represents the sign of the largest eigenvector. And so if the system that you test on, if the graph, if the problem that you solve, it has the property that the ground state coincides <laughs> with, with, that, um, with that value, then of course your, your machine will find it and it won't get stuck in the local minimum uh, on the way. So I think it is really, um, um, it is really um, a doable task, but the problems and the architecture has to be aiming and plus you know it's not an easy thing to find the precise uh, channel precise a uh, precise um, um, mechanism by which the system uh, would would find the global minimum and uh, actually going back to your example of the wind um, uh, wind tunnel uh, it's still not possible to calculate classically hmm. right so we still have to rely on actual the actual model and Russell Donnelly late Russell Donnelly actually at some point just a few years ago uh, came up with a proposal to use liquid helium to maintain the same Rayleigh number in the smaller models for the hmm. for the internal so they decrease the viscosity wow. so it's wow. still, um, it still acts as an analog simulator it still um, allows us to solve the particular problem faster Although, of course, we are not changing any, any, um, any limits, any asymptotics of the complexity um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. that underlies. Okay, sure. uh, I'm going to jump in there. I'm going to give Andrew Daly a question. And then um, I maybe we'll go back to Benjamin after that. I, so, so, I, so I apologize, Dave, that as I wrote to my, my question as a comment on, on the previous okay. discussion briefly, if, if, that's, if that's okay. Um, so what... Ben said about the original work with Adam's optical lattice has been captured by mean fielders is perfectly correct. And I think for the, that's a good description of how things were sort of at the beginning of those, um, those studies. What people can do now though with cold atoms in quantum gas microscopes where you can prepare different sort of initial states and then look at time dependent dynamics with the level of calibration they have in current experiments and with the specific types of correlation functions that they can now extract. Uh, we've been analyzing how that compares with what you can compute classically in these systems. And I think it's a fairly clear claim that probably Emmanuel would have made himself, I've heard him made, uh, make over the last five or six years several times, and I think justifiably so now, that they really can do things in a programmable fashion in the experiments that go beyond what you can compute classically. We're actually writing something up on that at the moment, and I will say a few words about that as part of sort of a bigger survey of what people are doing with cold atoms uh, in my talk tomorrow. 
Um, so I won't take up a lot of time in the panel discussion. Um, but yeah, I think that there's a lot that can be said. And uh, Scott mentioned also Michelle Lucan's experiments with Rydberg atoms. I would say the same thing about those, the way that things are at the moment. Hmm. I, I look forward to seeing that paper when it's on the archives. I, I'll, I'll send it to you once you're you yeah, just drafting at the moment. So. Please. All right, let's go back to uh, Benjamin. Um, we never really let you make a statement other than commenting on other people's stuff. <laughs> oh, I don't have many statements. I'm just a simple country experimentalist. <laughs> um, but uh, I, you know, again, it's great to, uh, to be able to talk to you all. Um, I, I guess what I'm interested in is the fact that uh, we can now have in our laboratories physical systems that operate at the confluence of three formally disparate fields, quantum optics, statistical physics, and computation. And these operate in um, three different sets of languages. And it's very hard, at least for me and you know, my colleagues, Jonathan Keelings here too, Andrew Daly, it's hard to piece together a complete understanding of these systems because you ask questions typically that are not just in one realm, like what is the next expectation of a macroscopic observable like you do in stat mech, but you ask, does it give me the right answer to something that I've programmed? And it's really hard to kind of merge those things together. And we're trying to figure out how to do that. Why are we trying to do that? Well, um, you know, we like to do quantum experiments. These are the things that are now have been rebranded as quantum simulations, but we're just quantum experimentalists. Um, we're trying to make better wind tunnels, uh, to use Scott's phrase, um, because we feel that in certain specialized cases, we can um, find answers to our questions more efficiently in this format. Um, what are the ingredients that we can bring to bear on this um, that might be new? Okay, so why are we having this meeting? Um, well, with the quantum optical systems, we have at our disposal zero entropy baths which um, effectively allow us to have uh, uh, very powerful dynamics that yield uh, effective error correction in the system itself without having to do it in some top level abstracted uh, mechanism. We have Bose stimulation, which uh, David alluded to earlier, um, you know, which is due to a property of quantum statistics that may help um, to increase an amplitude that you care about. And uh, we have at play quantum criticality. So we have a phase transition, a critical phase transition, maybe even a quantum phase transition, certainly non-equilibrium. And critical dynamics of this, correlation lengths, et cetera, if you can get around um, critical slowing down might help you to find an answer. Now, again, um, these are all contingent on the fact that the hardware um, might be better than you know, the other the other guy, it's like the bear, you know, you don't have to uh, be faster than the bear, you just have to be faster than the other guy who's also running away from the bear. So uh, we're not doing something that's asymptotically uh, better, but maybe just a little bit better than the next guy. Um, so I'm excited about trying to understand what does quantum criticality and a phase transition, both stimulation and zero entropy paths do for us when you add the questions of computation to this. Okay, um, I'm going to open it up if the general uh, audience wants to text me questions. Again, I will allow the, those to be, uh, I could either read them for you or you can just flag me. Um, the way to do this is with chat. I realize there's some kind of hand waving feature on Zoom, but I know nothing about that. So you have to actually uh, uh, text me. Um, okay. So uh, I, I'm going to try to unmute uh, Charles Liang at this point, uh, if I can find him on the list here and let him ask his own question. All right, if you're there, Charles, uh, feel free to ask your question. Okay, thank you. Um, I just said a quick question. So earlier, uh, Scott mentioned the analogy of mini black holes in a quantum computer. I was wondering, is there an analogy for um, many? Um, I think. I can't hear. I'm reading his question. An analogy for neutron stars in a quantum computer. I think this is directed to Scott. Uh, yeah, so, so by the way, I, I wasn't talking about an analogy. I was talking about literally using a black hole to do computation. 
you know, these, are, these are the kinds of things, at least that my friends in quantum gravity now talk about, right? And uh, uh, sometimes, you know, in ways where you would never be able to communicate the answer to anyone else, because you would only get it as you were hurtling toward the singularity or even uh, inside of a wormhole that connected that singularity to another one. Um, uh, so uh, a, a neutron star, you know, I would expect to be governed by, you know, quantum chromodynamics, basically, which is a quantum field theory, uh, which, you know, there has not been a detailed analysis of, of QCD specifically, but I wouldn't see any deep reason why it could not be efficiently simulated with a standard quantum computer. Right. So, I mean, you know, the, the, some of the, the issues with, uh, um, um, you know, with, with, with black holes come about just because, you know, we are not even sure how to do quantum mechanics itself, you know, in situations where general relativity is important. Right. And I think that that is where a lot of the confusion comes from. And that is also where sort of some of the possibility comes from that maybe you could violate the quantum extended church Turing thesis there. Uh, with neutron stars, I would expect it to be a quantum field theory, you know, a strongly coupled one, but one that you could in principle simulate with a quantum computer. Okay, I have a question from the audience and this is a deceptively, deceptively simple question which will probably lead to a fight. Um, but um, we've been using the term quantum supremacy uh, and someone asks for a good definition of quantum supremacy that would apply both to, you know, bit like quantum computers and also analog systems. Uh, so anybody want to take a stab at, at giving us a working definition of that? Maybe a couple people for the non-expert. I think we do have one expert. So <laughs> I, mean, I mean, okay, I mean, I do, I, I can, I can tell the, you, I let's... can tell you my definition of quantum supremacy, which is, I think, is based basically coincides with uh, John Preskill's. You know, Preskill is the one who coined the term in 2012. Uh, so, you know, what it means is, you know, the use of uh, um, a quantum computer, or you know, if 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 we wanted to talk about analog supremacy, then we would say the use of an analog computer. You know, but to solve some problem, so you know a well-defined problem uh, much faster than the same problem could be solved uh, uh, with, with a, a standard digital computer, uh, or at least that, 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 that we know how to solve it with any digital computer that, that currently exists. Uh, so you know, this, is, this, this, this is a somewhat loose definition by its nature, but I can clarify a couple aspects of it. Uh, you know, the problem being solved definitely does not need to be a useful problem, okay? But it does need to be a well-defined problem. In other words, it has to be at least logically possible for your device to not solve the problem, right? <laughs> to output a wrong answer, okay? So just simulate the physics of my device does not count as such a problem, right? You need to be able to give an independent mathematical specification of, of what, is, what is to be done such that your device does it, you know, and a classical computer could eventually do the same thing, but it's just that a classical computer cannot do it easily, you know, can't do it feasibly. Now, what do we mean by faster? You know, how much faster? We could say, um, we kind of mean three things by it, uh, at least in the context of quantum supremacy. You know, maybe for analog supremacy, one wants to mean something different, okay? But for quantum supremacy, one means, first of all, that one is getting a speed up, you know, that let's say one can do something in a few minutes that would take, you know, uh, days or, or weeks or months using the biggest supercomputers that are easily available, running the fastest algorithms that anybody knows. Okay, so you have an order of mag, an order, several orders of magnitude, at least uh, speed up, just in terms of the wall clock time. Okay, but secondly, we want it to be for a problem that has a theoretical asymptotic speed up, right? So we want to know that the advantage, you know, could become greater and greater as we went to a larger and larger device. And then the third thing is we want the only explanation that's available for the observed speed up to make reference to the asymptotic speed up. Okay, so in other words, when anyone asks, 
how were you able to do this a thousand times faster with a quantum computer than with you know the uh, summit supercomputer or the biggest supercomputer on earth uh, I want uh, I want to rule out any possible explanation for how it happened other than well you know you know there was this nine quadrillion dimensional Hilbert space right I mean I want the the only possible explanations to make reference to you know the uh, the the you know the the enormity of you know the space of quantum states and you know the sort of the reasons why we expect the speed up to actually be asymptotic in nature. You know, now the reason why I insist on all that is that I would I want to rule out claims of quantum supremacy uh, like the ones that uh, uh, the company DeWing, for example, very notoriously made. You know, for more than a decade, uh, where you know they have a device, it clearly has some uh, quantum behavior, like some quantum tunneling behavior. It can solve certain problems of basically like finding its own ground state, simulating itself. It seems to get a speed up over classical computers for at least some such problems. But, you know, D-Wave was never able to convince the community that the speed ups that they were seeing were because of quantum computation, right? Rather than just because of you know, the, you know, you build a special purpose device and it tends to be very fast for simulating itself, right? So we want to really know that the, that the origin of this speed up comes from something that is asymptotic in nature. So that is my working definition of quantum supremacy. Okay, so uh, I've got two people in the queue. Uh, Victor no. Galinsky uh, is going to have to leave soon, so I'm going to let him have um, I think I think I'm, I'm going to have to leave soon, too, by the okay. way. So All right, so I've got Victor Glitzky and Jonathan Keeling in the queue. Uh, Victor, are you still with us? Uh, if you are, you can jump in there, uh, and then we'll have Jonathan Keeling going. If Victor doesn't jump in, I'm going to let Jonathan go. All right. Uh, Jonathan, go ahead. So, um, thank you. So, so I had two questions. I guess one is mostly to Natalia and the other one is more, more broad. Um, so we're, when asking about where where the speed limit comes in this kind of gain dissipative quant um, computation approach, if, if the problem I was trying to solve was the nearest neighbor Ising model, I, I know really clearly where the speed limit comes from. It's from kibble zurek it's from the formation of defects, um, when you go through a phase transition. And phase transitions help, but they don't help um, hugely. Well, when we look at this kind of highly disordered problem with all-to-all -all connectivity, do we think this speed limit is fundamentally different to kibble zurek or is it kibble zurek in disguise because of a non-locality? Um, no, but first of all, yes, if you have... <laughs> If you have just nearest neighbor interactions, you have two dimensional system and then you, you have the KT transition. So even you, if you start with the noise, you will still have the isolated vortices um, preventing you from finding the ground state. Once you have more connectivity, it's kind of you have three dimensional uh, network and then you have vortices. And we know that in dissipative system, the vortices actually can shrink and can actually bring the system to, uh, to the true, true minimum. So, it's not, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, with more connectivity, some dynamical process in your system may actually help to find the true global minimum. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I guess really the question is, do, is this just sort of intuitive guesses or is it, uh, do we know enough about the, the nature of defect formation when you sweep through a phase transition in a glassy system at finite rates? And is that the problem we're really trying to, to answer? No. Um, but it also depends whether you have equilibrium or non-equilibrium system. The behavior will be different. Well, if if I think about non-equilibrium, gain dissipative if it, system. If it is at finite rate, then I think it's per definition uh, uh, out of equilibrium. Uh, no, no, but if... Um, it also depends, and it goes also to, <laughs> to Vincenzo's question about the coupling. Because if I think, and it's also what David, actually, David, you, uh, I just reading your, uh, your question. So this all three questions came together. Because if you have, um, it's all determined by the sign of the coupling. So first I will answer Vincenzo's question during your talk, right? Okay. Actually, when I talk about, when I uh, mention the complex coupling, 
the complex part of the coupling is your hopping. Predominantly yes, yes. in my system, I have this J, which is, uh, which, which is not Josephson coupling. It's this dissipative coupling because it comes, it has the same sign as the, the, the gain. As you say, it's dissipative coupling, so it doesn't, it doesn't admit a direct Hamiltonian description. Exactly. And therefore, you know, David's question was about the 2D KT transition. It's again, it's, it's a different type of transition. It's not KT. Um, and yeah, so it's all, um, it's the, the dynamics will of the system is different. And answering now uh, Jonathan's question, with just uh, this dissipative coupling, if I assume that my Josephson coupling is negligible, the system will reach the, um, the, 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 the fixed point for any configuration, for long range, short range, just two dimensional ising. The, the behavior of the system will be different from if I had, if I quenched, and then I have an equilibrium system to find the ground state. I think that's the, that's the biggest difference between, between the phenomenology that you, you have in mind. Okay, so, so for we... our system, if I have only real coupling, the system will find a um, minimal fixed point. I mean, it okay, may not so we... be necessarily the, the ground state. May, may, but... may, I, may I briefly comment on-, well, on... No, actually, I, uh, um, Victor, uh, we figured out how to unmute him and he wants to make one response to Scott's definition of quantum supremacy. Uh, it's actually not so much uh, a response, uh, it's, uh, uh, a question. So it seems that this uh, quantum supremacy is so defined is defined relative to uh, classical best classical alg algorithm available at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, this seems to depend on how much effort has been put in actually doing that. So say I'm yeah, a totally useless yeah. problem for which no classical algorithm exists, then any quantum computer will be quantum supreme. So I'm wondering what is actually known with mathematical rigor about quantum supremacy kind of in absolute sense without reference to... Well, okay, uh, so, so, so anything that a quantum computer can do, a classical computer can also do, okay? Mm -hmm. I, mentioned this, I mentioned that in my talk or you know, in my remarks before, but maybe that's worth saying again, right? If given enough time, a classical computer can always just, for example, store the entire wave function in memory. Right, and then mm -hmm. just keep updating it, you know, uh, uh, by a bunch of matrix vector multiplies. So, uh, so, so in that sense, quantum computers can only ever give us an exponential speed up over a classical computer, you know, at, mm -hmm. least, at least with respect to, you know, number of gates or, or number of time steps. Okay, now furthermore, uh, no one has proven that a quantum computer can even get that exponential speed up for any problem. Okay, and, and there's a good reason why, uh, because in order to be able to prove that, you know, rigorously, uh, you would have to prove things in complexity theory, like P not equal to P space, okay, which are enormous open problems in mathematics and complexity theory, right? If, yeah, if P yeah. were equal to P space, it would mean that you could easily simulate a quantum computer, okay? So, uh, so the best that we can do is uh, have candidate problems, like factoring, like you know the Google style quantum supremacy experiment, uh, um, you know like quantum simulations, uh, you know where you know we can show how to do it efficiently with a quantum computer, and then we can conjecture that you know classical algorithm needs an exponentially greater amount of time. Sometimes we can justify that belief, you know, based on other beliefs about computational hardness. Mm -hmm. One of the main things that led up to Google doing the experiment that it did was, you know, a sequence of results by, by me and others that basically said, if you had a fast classical algorithm that could sample from these same probability distributions that these, you know, experiments would, would sample from, or, you know, and could do it exactly, then this would lead to things like the collapse of the polynomial hierarchy. Okay, so that would have sort of very, very uh, um, uh, staggering effects on, on complexity theory. Um, you know, even, even then, you know, you could say, you know, the experiments, you know, only, you know, have a lot of noise in them. And so then you have to worry about, you know, the noisy version, you know, what, what if we only had a classical computer that could do a noisy version of this experiment? And then there we know less. Uh, but, uh, you know, so, so, so it's all based on conjectures about hardness and we should be completely clear that quantum supremacy is not a milestone like landing on the moon, 
okay? It is more like, you know, beating the best humans at chess, you know, like Deep Blue beating Kasparov. It's a milestone that could be achieved and then unachieved a year later, you know, if, you know, the, because classical computing can fight back, right? <laughs> Um, you know, but, but the, you know, what, what they said in the Google paper at the end of it, I thought was actually very wise, which is that you know, they said, yes, we expect that classical simulations of our experiment are going to improve considerably from what they are, you know, but, you know, as long as they remain exponential, you know, well, you know, the quantum computers are also going to be rapidly improving. And so we expect that from this point out that, you know, that the, the cool, for these sampling tasks, the quantum devices are going to be winning. You know, of course, yep. that, that is a belief that could be falsified, but, you know, that's, you know, I think that that is the belief to falsify. I'm going to let uh, Vicenza go next. Yeah, yeah thank you. I, I, I have actually a, a question for, uh, for Scott, which is the following. I'm interested uh, in the possibility that uh, no noise in, uh, in the digital uh, model of quantum computing, noise uh, may give you a handle to, to, to classically simulate uh, with the result of the quantum computation with uh, some kind of advantage. I don't say, I mean, my argument is the following. Uh, if you have uh, zero errors, then uh, it's hard, okay? You have these, uh, these uh, very, very sophisticated algorithms developed by IBM and so on, uh, the deferred tensor contraction, this kind, this, this, all these things, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If the errors dominate, then you have uh, whatever you do, you put as an input, you have a constant distribution of the amplitudes and this is trivial to, to sample, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. is there a continuity argument in the mm -hmm. complexity? So I mean, mm -hmm. uh, if I now draw a line between the two extreme cases, yeah. uh, I argue that in the middle, I should be able to write an algorithm or as a physicist mm -hmm. to, de to, de to devise a theory, a formalism that some somehow compromises between the complexity of the full uh, of the real deal and the, and the triviality of the yeah. what do you think about there, this? There, there there have been a lot of results about exactly what you're asking about just within the last year or two right partly you know prompted by the the you know the, the google result and by the mm -hmm. debate with ibm okay there's work by aram harrow and collaborators um um, I think uh, uh, Rolando de Placa, uh, you know, a, a bunch of others, you know, and, and, and there are many cases where you can use noise to improve, you know, your classical simulation, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, a, a, a very, very trivial, you know, there are much more interesting examples, but a very trivial example of this would be, let's say that I know that my output distribution is like, only, you know, like, like one minus epsilon times the uniform distribution yeah. plus only epsilon times the hard distribution. You know, and this would be a sim very simple model for what does happen in Google's case. Right? Yeah, that's, that's in, in, in their case, epsilon is, let's say, about 0 0.002. Right? <laughs> they get about 0.2% signal, 99.8% noise. Right? Now, if I want to simulate that with my classical computer, I can always do the following. Just most of the time, I output a uniformly random sample, okay? But only a small fraction of the time, I output a sample from the distribution that I'm supposed to, right? <laughs> right? And then, you know, in an, on the average case, or, you know, in an amortized sense, right, I've gotten a huge speed up. Yes. Okay, but notice, notice that even here, the speed up I've gotten, you know, it may be by a factor of 500 or whatever, but it's by some constant yeah. factor depending on what is my noise rate. And I still have it to, I'm still paying a cost of two to the N, right? Yes, I'm and, still paying a cost that is exponential in the number of qubits. And if okay. I may add, uh, I, I think yeah. this is, this is only uh, this is also because uh, you have uh, you are simulating a, a random circuit model because if you wanted to simulate a specific algorithm like for example Shor's algorithm mm -hmm. then your argument wouldn't work i mean i can't just uh, or would would it would it well no i mean I, I think i think that actually would work for simulating work. Shor's algorithm i could you know most of the time i mean to simulate a super noisy version of Shor's algorithm i could most of the time output noise, occasionally output the factors of a number, right? But the point is that, you know, whatever is the noise rate, that will determine the fraction of the time that I have to actually go and factor the number, 
And when I do that, then I'm still paying an exponential cost using any classical algorithm. So I think that what, you know, we would say is that, you know, based on current knowledge, as long as the noise rate, you know, is constant, or as long as we are willing to treat it as a constant, constant. then, you know, it looks like with all of the known algorithms, we still will have quantum supremacy, right? We have, you know, the classical simulation cost will grow exponentially with the number of qubits. Um, if, on the other hand, you know, someone was like Gil Kalai, they believe that there's some deep reason why the uh-huh. signal has to go down exponentially with the number of qubits, right? And no error correction will ever work to stop that from happening. Well, then, you know, then, then, then th- th- that would be the kind of thing that could kill quantum supremacy. Okay, so I'm going, we're going to have to start to wind down. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go in reverse order, uh, let each person make a a sort of final statement. So I'm going to go to Benjamin first and uh, you give a comment and any uh, final things that you want to say as well. Hey, this is my final statement. So so I'll just raise, uh, re raise what Jonathan Keeling uh, asked. I, I have a slightly different interpretation of his question from a few moments ago. Um, than what was addressed. Um, I I think one thing that we're struggling with is understanding what goes wrong when you try to, um, when you try to drive a system, a spin glassy system, a a disordered frustrated system that's presumably complex and of interest into its optimal state. Is this a challenge that is different from the kind of kibble Zurich errors that one gets in a generic second order phase transition, or is it additionally more difficult due to arrested dynamics that you get and slowing down that you get in these kinds of disordered and frustrated systems? I don't think we understand this very well, and therefore we don't know how our quantum optical systems can play a role in expediting this solution finding. Okay, Uh, um, Scott, do you wanna make a final statement? Yeah, I I think I've, I've, I've yammered enough. Okay, Natalia? No, I just would like to thank everyone. It was very interesting discussion. So. Oh, we're all just so friendly today. Um, Vincenzo, final comments? I think, uh, no, I mean, my only, my only point is that uh, uh, it's uh, a, a, a question like this that, uh, that uh, embodies uh, many, many areas uh, of uh, physics, mathematics, uh, and computer science uh, is uh, perhaps uh, even more... Uh, I mean, makes myself even more enthusiastic and curious uh, uh, than than just simple physics questions. And I think that uh, that it's uh, it's really fascinating, uh, and uh, well, we have a we have a beautiful way ahead. Uh, okay, so we have uh, two more days. So one thing I do want to say: um, we have been recording all these. So if you check back to this same Zoom link in about an hour, uh, I should have been able to put on the chat a uh, link for a Dropbox where the recordings are. And feel free uh, to forward those to other people if you want. Um, So uh, with that, uh, we'll close it off and we'll start again at 10 o'clock Eastern time uh, tomorrow morning then. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.